Savvy Central Radio, drawing out the best from our guest with your host, Christina Nitchman. This is your host, Christina Nitchman. Each week, Savvy runs weekly broadcasts providing entrepreneurs and successful individuals a platform to express their dreams, hopes, lessons learned, expertise, and wisdom with the world. Our guest today is Sharon Boone, an accomplished writer and editor with more than 25 years' experience at the most successful magazines, including Fitness, Glamour, Seventeen, and Women's Day. As a cocktail connoisseur, Sharon created her blog, TheLusciousLife.com, a lifestyle and libation education site for women dedicated to sips and success. Sharon's blog combines her life lessons with how to make the perfect cocktail. Find out more about Sharon and her blog at TheLusciousLife.com. That is T H E L U S H. I O U S Life dot com. Hi, Sharon. Welcome to Savvy Central Radio. How are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. Thank you for having me on. I'm happy that Darren, your husband, introduced us and had you come on over here. You have a very interesting journey. You have been in the world of publishing and writing, and ultimately, you started to share your passion through a wonderful blog called The Luscious Life, which is a very interesting name. Explain for our audience a little bit about how your writing career and publishing career came to be and The Luscious Life blog came to be. When I was in college, I started off, I wanted to be a doctor. Organic chemistry class kind of killed that dream for me and many, many others. I found that later. But at the same time, I was always interested in writing and I was a journalism major even while I was taking science courses. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated, I went right into magazines. I've always loved magazines and became a health editor, kind of fell into that because it aligned very well with my past desire to be a doctor. And I bounced around from different magazines. I was at um, Woman's Day. I was at McCall's when it still existed. I went to uh, Seventeen Magazine. Mm -hmm. And I started doing more like lifestyle kinds of things and not just strictly health. Then I had a stint at Glamour and then at Essence Magazine Mm -hmm. and Fitness. And then I went back to Essence for the second time. And at that point, They asked me, in addition to um, editing the health pages, to also edit the food pages, which seems like, I mean, it's two completely different jobs. Mm -hmm. But I was like, oh, I like food. I like cooking. So I kind of threw myself into learning more about it. And I think, you know, what really came across was when you have this enthusiasm of like a novice and it's just like everything you ask more questions, which is really great. Mm-hmm. as a journalist and a writer, because I don't, what's that? What does that do? How is that? Why do you do that? And putting those stories together, I realized that the magazine didn't really cover spirits or wine mm. to go along with the food, which is sort of like unusual for an, if a magazine covers food, mm. you know, they tend to go together. Yeah. I think the thinking was that they just had never done it. And so no one ever thought to do it. But in the meantime, I had sort of fallen into uh, the mixology world. I went to a very famous bar in New York City called Employees Only Hmm. that sort of was at the forefront of the revival of the cocktail movement. And I happened to go there with a friend the week that it opened. And all of it was fascinating to me. And I had that same sort of enthusiasm. And these master bartenders, were really great guys. And so I asked a million questions and they very patiently answered. And I kept going back every week, either Friday or Saturday, I'd be there. And it's like, what does that taste like? Why is that in that bottle? Why did you put that over there? You know, and I just found it really interesting. And so I decided to like, try to sort of integrate that into, onto the pages of Essence magazine a little bit at a time, because I realized that the readership, that that's how people live now. It's not about drinking to get drunk, Mm -hmm. not like drunken weekly. It's more about in the same way that you enjoy taste and flavors of foods and trying different foods, you do, you can do the same Mm -hmm. with spirits. And so then people were really interested in it. And I realized that in all that time of me asking questions, I 
had acquired some knowledge, which I always say is like an inch deep, but a mile wide. I know a little bit about a lot of different things, and then I know who to ask to find out more. And I realized, yeah, and then I realized that readers wanted to know more because they had the same questions that I always had. Mm. Uh, that was a really good point that you mentioned. Uh, Ford had said that someone had um, brought up to his attention, "Hey, you've never even finished high school or something like that or higher education." He said, "I don't have to. I hire the people." I need to get me the information I need to run my business. So I thought that was interesting because it was like, you don't need to know all the information in the world. You just need to know where to get it. <laughs> right, exactly. And if you, if you don't have that sort of curiosity and that enthusiastic curiosity mm -hmm. about something like maybe you're in the wrong job. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking the digital age, as you've worked in it for so many years in, in publishing and such, has really made it a change to working in publishing anyway. It's, it's probably brought about um, a whole new way of doing publishing, I would think. Yes. And I like my love of magazines was always the love of the printed page. I'm old enough that there wasn't any digital age when I first got in the business. So it's so like a I wouldn't say it's exactly love hate relationship. I don't hate the digital age, but it has brought about the end of what I really loved about print magazines. You know, that business is the business model. I don't think it's going to ever be resurrected and slowly but surely all of the print publications are going to start to fade away, which is a shame. But this is a time very much where they can reinvent themselves for the digital age and the way that people like to have their information presented to them today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, it has opened up the doors to a lot of different opportunities and, like you said, different ways that the information can be brought to it, their clients. I personally love a book in my hand, and so now doing what I'm doing now, interviewing people around the world, they mostly want to send me their books in digital format, and I'm just like, can't you mail it to me? I want to hold it in my <laughs> hands. No, so I understand exactly what you're talking about, but I do see that there's also opportunities, and I don't think we'll completely lose all books, but I think for the most part, the majority of people are going to get their books on digital in the future. Yeah, and I and and I agree with you. I mean, I I just like to have that the feel the weight of a book or the you know to feel the glossiness of the paper of a magazine. And there's something mm. like satisfying about ripping out a page or like a beautiful picture. A lot of people like to do vision boards mm. and and uh, inspiration boards. And Pinterest can kind of give you that feel mm -hmm. in a digital space, but it's not the same thing. Yeah, you know what, I don't, I don't know about you, Sharon, but I think it's that holding it in your hand that makes it more experiential. And I think mm -hmm. the digital age, as awesome as it, as it is, and the opportunities that exist are, are wonderful, I think it disconnects humans from each other, from the world, from the planet, because it doesn't have that experiential touch thing going on. You know, you don't get to feel it in your hand and be part of it. Right, and it's sort of like, is it real? Is this yeah. Is this a real thing? But mm -hmm. having said that, like, Digitally, I think is a great way to deliver information. Yeah. It's somehow it's and you and you also get pictures. It's the marrying of the two that just I feel like I like the page yeah. of it. Yeah. Well, there is something interesting coming about, and I don't know if you've witnessed it, and that is multimedia books where you have maybe videos and contain written portions, um, audio portions of the book, maybe more exercise experiential portions of the book, so that a book is very is brought to their client in a many different formats and many different not just pick up the page and read it. So it is interesting. Yeah, and I I mean I like those. As a content creator, like that presents quite a challenge because it's like trying to think of what idea you're trying to get across, but looking at it like from 360 degrees. Uh huh. Yeah. Because it's, there's more than one way to get it across. And it's like, okay, so what's the picture that we're going to tell? Is there a video? What is, and then as the creator, it's like, okay, now we have to shoot a video. Now we have to get the pictures. Now we have yeah. to get the words. Now we have to get sound. It's a lot, but. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's interesting. It's a thorny challenge, but a good one. Yeah, I get you there. And because like Savvy, we've been in audio podcast and now AMFM for the past 
year we've hit the AMFM arena and our audience was telling us more and more they wanted to see us on video and that is just as you said prevent presents a lot of different other challenges which I've never had to worry about like when I'm sitting here right right now with you in my living room it, it's just a totally <laughs> different <laughs> as you can imagine a much different experience but I like what you said before Sharon when you talked about being mixologist and being curious and realizing but a lot of us really enjoy the getting out and meeting friends and having cocktails and it doesn't have to be about getting plastered and drunk it can be about having a good time and experiencing different flavors yes I mean I found that um, in the past two years I've been lucky enough as when I worked at Essence Magazine to go down to New Orleans for the Essence Festival which is going on for this will be the 21st year and it's four days over 4th of July weekend. And it's just this huge party. And I saw like way too many people sort of weaving around wow. yeah. at hotel lobbies and down the street with these giant fish bowls. <laughs> full of, they said, Oh, it's a hurricane. And it's just like some kind of iridescent, not, they don't know what's in these drinks. Yeah. And I was like, there's a place for that. Sometimes we've all if you're somebody who drinks, mm. we've all had that time, maybe when you're younger, where you were just like, you know what, I'm just going, I want to, I kind of want to get drunk or I want to celebrate in something or I'm out with friends. But that, those times are rare. And to me, that's like when you want to drink mm -hmm. versus when you want to drink, mm. you know? And I think that I wanted to sort of show people that, you know, like grown folks mm -hmm. can enjoy different spirits, can enjoy a cocktail can sit and sip it, can have one or two, mm -hmm. still have a conversation, you know, still be, have all their wits about them and just enjoy the taste and the flavors of them. And I think that nowadays, like the trend has been going on for a long time in the mixology world of bars. They don't want you to get drunk. Mm -hmm. They want you, they want to serve you some interesting flavors. They want to serve you some cocktails, but they don't want to serve you to the point where you're past your capacity to, to think, you know, that's not, that's not helping anything. Yeah. Yeah. I get you. And, and actually, by the way, I went last year to New Orleans and I, I discovered just what you're talking about. I saw people weaving down the street with just those big uh, fish bowls worth of alcohol. And I was a little disillusioned because I was like every single restaurant had a array of flavors that looked like Slurpee machines that could just dull out yes. different <laughs> liquor type concoctions. And I was like, this is not, I mean, for me, the experience is I like a couple of different um, cocktails and they're generally sweet, desserty type drinks like a chocolate martini or um, mm -hmm. a pina colada, that type of thing, or daiquiri. And actually, um, me and my partner have had a lot more fun because you mentioned that some restaurants and places really want to give you the experience more than getting you plastered. I get disillusioned going out to restaurants and such because I find that they either water it down or give you too much. So my partner and I go out and buy the ingredients and we've gotten quite good at making some of our favorite drinks right at home. Well, I mean, I think that that's great. And I and that's something else that I wanted to impart to readers is that you can do these things at home, especially like the, the drinks that, you, that tend to be like favorites, like a mm. margarita or a daiquiri or people like martinis. They're not a million ingredients. Mm. You can make a mojito at home. You use fresh ingredients. You do it yourself. It doesn't take a lot of, uh, other than buying the actual spirits, like it doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of specialized equipment. Yeah. And when you have that and you're like, this is delicious. It's like simple. It's elegant. It's good versus the Slurpee machine, <laughs> frozen margarita and, the, you know, some other flavor or something like that. Like, you know, leave that with the spring break crowd. Yeah, I think I, I feel like, you know, we can do better. For That's sure. what I always say is like, you know what, you can do better than that. You deserve better than that. For sure. And it's your body. You don't want to put in your body either too much alcohol or a yucky tasting drink that's not good for your body. I mean, what's funny is I've invited and we've had parties here where I'll mix drinks and I get really into it where I, I like kind of dance around and mix it really hard and people get to laughing and then we all take turns, you know, shaking the shaker. And mm -hmm. uh, it can be a lot of fun. I, I 
particularly for my taste, like frothy type drinks. So um, I have a lot of fun mixing it for people and, and seeing them get excited about trying them and, and realizing that, hey, you could also make it at home, have an enjoyable experience and make it to your liking and have it be cheaper than had you bought it outside. So there's options. But tell our audience why you created your blog, the Luscious Life blog, and what was your goal behind creating it? I created it because, as I said, I felt like, you know what, people, you can do better than what you have been doing. You can drink better. And, you know, it's a bad pun, but, you know, I wanted to raise the bar. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I feel that um, oftentimes, particularly for women, we might want to try some different kind of drink. You know, a lot of people tend to go to have a go-to drink. And it might be the same one that they drank in college because they know that they liked it. Mm -hmm. But now it's 15 years later and you're still, you're ordering like a fuzzy navel and you're at like a business dinner or something like that. And it's just like, "Mm, (laughs) I love a sex on the beach, but my boss is sitting right there. I don't, should I, you know? And so the idea that it's okay if you don't know something, like we're going to learn this together and you can sort of expand your palate. And I feel that a lot of times for, for people, and I tell bartenders this all the time, it's like one of the hardest things that questions that somebody might get in their day is they sit down at the bar and the bartender comes over and says, what do you have? And your mind just goes blank <laughs> because, and you think that, oh, they're going to judge me or I don't want to be to look like I'm stupid or I don't know. So I'm just going to say like the first thing that comes in my head. And that's why you're, you know, maybe still drinking Cosmo's 10 years later and then you like them and there's nothing wrong with liking them, but that's the only thing you ever get. Or, you know, well, I've just go with my Chardonnay, like try some other flavors. If you like that, you know, maybe try something else that might be in that wheelhouse. And I feel like my blog, I'm trying to give people permission to sort of play in that Mm. arena. Yeah. And so, okay. Yeah. I was just going to notice, I noticed you tie certain life lessons to, the mixology lessons and, and um, experiences that you passed on, which I really enjoyed. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, well, I mean, the, one of the good things about hanging out in bars, and uh, my mom always, she cringes because she's like, it makes it seem like you just go to bars all the time. And it's like, <laughs> well, I like bars, you know, and I'm not going to bars to get drunk, but I tend to have very interesting conversation in bars. And it's just a place, it feels like a, a place where you can just sort of like just talk to people, like especially in this day and age when we tend to do everything through a device mm. and we don't really have face to face conversations. And it's there's still one of the few places where you can actually just strike up a conversation with a total stranger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and have it be like, you know, and walk away from it like, wow, that was really interesting. I would have never spoken to that person who knew that some of the stories and the people that I've met at these places have just been like, I mean, it just seems like, well, that was amazing. And so I try to bring that, put that experience in the blog too. So I like talk a lot about things that are happening in in my life, things that have happened in the world, you know, just sort of tie it all in because, you know, that's, Mm -hmm. that's what a, you know, a comfortable bar is like. Yeah. I love that you're mentioning that, Sharon, because when I was a kid, actually, my my dad's from Germany. And when we would go visit my grandparents in Germany, it's very bar centric. There's actually a bar in my parents' town on every other corner. And at first, you know, as an American, you're like, oh, my God, they must be all luscious around here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and actually, they're not. I mean, they do have a quite a bit of beer, the family. And I found that very early on. If you're a child, they'll have you go into the bar with them. And it's a very family feel. It's not like a lot of the bars here in the United States, which feels mm-hmm. specifically like you don't want to bring your kids in there or family. But it, they, you generally have food and the kids get this little mug or, or um, beer stein. And it's this kind of dark beer that looks like Malta that you would drink in Puerto Rico. Uh, it had that same type of flavor, and that's what they give the kids. So they get to join in in the festivities and have a nice drink that's all bubbly and, you know, whatever. But it's more like connection and people sharing their lives, their stories. And it's a very nice experience, and it would be awesome to bring that back to here in the United States and have us, like, really connect as people, put down your textures, enjoy a nice drink, whether it be alcoholic or otherwise, and really connect with one another. 
And I think that that would also help them making a connection between enjoying a drink, going to a bar and the social aspect of it, as opposed to the getting drunk aspect of it. Because I think that if we only think of that as to go and get drunk, that's all that's going to happen there. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And I mean, actually, me and my partner enjoy a nice drink and we go and we have a couple of favorites that we go on. Sometimes we try wine, depending on what um, restaurant we're at. And we went to a nice one last year where they served us the hugest margarita I've ever seen in this huge. It wasn't a fishbowl, but it was a big cup that was almost like a fishbowl. And we had two straws and and we drank it very slowly for about four or five hours, just watching people watching. And after mm-hmm. we we almost finished it, um, the bartender, or not the bartender, the waiter came over and said, hey, can I get you another one? I know I want to send you out of here smashed. And and we both looked at him and said, we're not looking to get smashed. We're looking to have a nice afternoon. <laughs> See, yeah, that's, I I don't like that aspect of it. I mean, the, one of the things that I like like to talk about and talk to people about is sort of like, bar expectations you know and for me then that's a place I don't want to go to Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to a place that's that they are actively trying to like hey it's a party get smashed (laughs) like why why would you do that Mm -hmm. just just as you said before you've gone to places and they water down Mm. the alcohol and things like I mean sometimes you go in it's a new place you don't know yeah and then you find out and I think they're doing a disservice to their bar and they're doing a disservice to bars everywhere. So I like to think like when you walk in, sort of like gauge the room and see like what level of a a place that it is. And um, one of the tips I always say, the first thing I always look for are bars that have little hooks underneath the bar for your purse mm. or your coat, because a lot of most better bars will have that. And it's like a small thing. But to me, that's just showing that they're thinking that much through the customer experience that you have someplace. Because, you know, as as a woman, you go in and it's like, where am I going to put my bag? Well, I'm not going to, you know, hook it on the back of the bar stool on the back of the chair because, you know, I can somebody can pick my pocket or whatever. And so there's always this like, where am I going to put my bag? Oh, where am I going to put my coat? Oh, here's a hook right here. So I always feel for it. And I'm like, okay. They have a hook, so then I, I'm thinking they've gone up in my estimation, and that's even before I start looking to see like what kind of bottles they have and what spirits they have to figure out if they, you know, how serious they are about it. But to to me, that's a good gauge. Any place that's, you know, where they're actively trying to make get people drunk or like really going down the like, hey, party hardy route, yeah. like, you know. Yeah, I like that you mentioned that, and that goes for everyone listening in, regardless of your business, is that really paying attention how to provide your customers the best experience, how to make it a positive customer experience. And so, you know, Sharon, I want to find out from you, what are your great plans for your business going forward? What's your great vision in the next year? Well, hopefully, I will be still writing about some great new cocktails and new there's a bunch of new whiskeys that are coming out that I'm very excited about because um, that's one of the things that I started to get into in the last few years when I started to do this. And I hope that I'll be able to grow my audience. You know, I'm, I'm like a baby baby blog right now. Mm. So I, I want to grow it so that I can start to like monetize it at some point, yeah. maybe in the next year or two. I don't know. And it would be great as we were talking before about telling stories in the digital space to be able to maybe add more video or some of those other elements, but like that gets complicated, but that's a nice problem to have. And I would love to be able to figure that out. Yeah. And you know what I'm thinking here? I don't know if it would work for your genre or you are actually mixing drinks and people actually want to probably see you doing that. But I love the stories you mentioned when you talk about different stories you come across or life lessons tied to mixing drinks that perhaps you could do a small podcast that either bring on mixologist or take some of the stories that you share with audience um, audibly. And what's cool about it is podcasts are virtually free. Yeah, that is definitely something else that I should be looking into. I think like one of my favorite stories, and I think it's um, that I have told is how kind of I got into it. My dad had, he built a bar in the basement of the house where I grew up and all of his friends Mm. also similarly had bars 
that they built in their basement. And that was just how they socialized. And it wasn't about always drinking a lot, but they'd play cards down there. But I grew up in a house that had a big, long, curved bar and mirrored behind it. Um, you know, bar stools. It was like a red top and a leather, black leather front. That just, I, I realized that I grew up like playing bartender and pretending to be, pretending to mix drinks with my friends. They'd come over and it would be say like, oh, well, what do you have? Whiskey? How many rocks? You know, like, <laughs> like that was, that's a question that you would actually get asked. And somebody said, I'll have five rocks in mine. I'll only have two. And, you know, we pretend to <laughs> clink them in the glass. And that to me is like a very fond memory. And uh, my dad passed away a couple of years ago, but I still like every time I'm thinking about like making a new drink or, or I'm at a bar or something, I just think like, oh, like dad would really like this or, you know, oh, he, he loved this whiskey or he'd like to try this. He'd really be interested in that. And so it, that's one of the stories like it sounds, it might sound weird to some people, but I feel closer to him in a bar setting than most people might about their dad who, and you know, he didn't drink to excess. He was, he was just like to entertain. He was very much like people come over to the house and have somewhere to hang out and watch TV and watch the game and all. And so I think that's where I come by it, honestly. Oh, that's an awesome story that you have that tie and bond to your dad that way. That's fabulous. We often tend to think in America, this is interesting because I grew up in a German family where we actually would often have beer, even at a very early age. What's, what I found interesting, I think I was about 13 and we had a, um, I think, Italian or Spanish class and they were talking about how bad alcohol was and it's evil and you shouldn't drink it. And I said, oh no, but we always have beer in Germany and it's really good and I've been having it since I was four. <laughs> and uh, so they, they were kind of looking at our whole household and the idea of having beer is being one step away from alcoholism. And actually, I don't think it necessarily has to be that way. Uh, even though we did have alcohol alcoholism in my family, I, I don't think the drinking of it means that there's more of a chance of becoming an alcoholic. Interestingly enough, Sharon, when I became an adult and all the young teenagers and early 20-year-olds are getting plastered, I had no desire to go out and drink to oblivion because I'd already been having beer and some wine since my teenage years and it wasn't a big deal. Right. And it didn't become this like forbidden thing or this rite of uh, passage. You know, it was just something that you do sometimes. So what's why? Why would you abuse that? Like, why would you have it to excess? It just doesn't make sense. I mean, I do think that in this country and I don't know well, we still have that that streak of, of from prohibition and that sort of like, you know, the evils of drink thing side by side with like, here are all the beer ads and all this stuff. Like, it's like so schizophrenic Yeah. where I think we should just have more of a balance. It's like, you know, you can have some drinks sometimes and that doesn't mean that, oh, every weekend or every other weekend, I'm going to go and I'm just going to like down as much as I can and then sleep it off. And then that's unhealthy. I mean, I, I don't think it's unhealthy to drink, to have some drink sometime. Yeah. And that's actually what you were mentioning, the kind of back and forth weird messaging that our culture has, because like, look at being healthy and skinny. We interpret your Barbie doll or super skinny to the point of anorexia. Oh, you're healthy. But then meanwhile, most of the commercials right after you see these beautiful models are like food commercials of glorious kind of filled packed of what do you call it? Preservatives and fattening and like McDonald's. And none of that is like the, the messaging is kind of wonky along with the idea of, oh, sex is bad. But, you know, then you see half naked teenagers and teenage or dramas on TV. And it's like, OK, I'm confused. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it good? Is it bad? <laughs> yeah. So it's just like, oh, look at this great thing. Well, you shouldn't have it. But oh, but look, it's so delicious. But no, now you've had too much. Yeah, like it, yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Like, And I think that that messaging like causes people to sort of zigzag between excess. Yeah. And then going through guilt and shame when they do go through excess and maybe end up on, on you know, in an area where, okay, now I'm overweight or now I'm too skinny or now I've drunk too much. So yes, I'm so grateful you're out here today to share some of these really important messages and to talk about your blog and your wisdom in this area. Everyone, please go to the luscious life. That is the luscious 
l u s h i o u s life dot com. And I want to thank you again, Sharon, for coming to share with us on Savvy Central Radio. Thank you so much. This has been delightful. Savvy Central Radio is home to over one hundred thousand listeners per month globally, and runs in syndication on eight AM and FM platforms, including iHeart Radio and six podcasting platforms. To find out more about our paid sponsorship opportunities, or to become a guest and find out how we can help you get your message out to the world, call seven one eight area code seven one three two two eight nine, or email at savvycentralradio at gmail dot com. 